Hi, this is Annie Fox of Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is Dr. Joni Cannell. Dr. Cannell is an organizational consultant and leadership coach who specializes in maximizing leadership potential. She's also the author of the book, Flying Without a Helicopter, How to Prepare Young People for Work and Life. Hi, Joni. Welcome to Family Confidential. Hi, Annie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for making the time. You know, I was very intrigued about your book, Flying Without a Helicopter, because I do a lot of parent education. And um, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, you have a lot of overachieving parents who tend to do what I call overparenting. And when that happens, as you and I probably know, you get some underfunctioning kids. And so I was really intrigued to read about your book and um, to find out more from you about how parents might be getting in the way of their kids' success, which is absolutely the last thing they want to be doing, but they don't know they're doing it. So help. Yeah, well, parents often have the best intentions. They want the most for their kids, Mm -hmm. and they're feeling the pressures these days on all the competition to get into the right schools, the right colleges, and get the right jobs. But when they go in there and do the work for the kids, as you said, they turn out to be under-functioning. And we see in the workplace that uh, they are not as resilient and adaptable. They're not able to be independent or communicate effectively because they haven't had an opportunity to learn those skills. That's what the book is about, how to, how to actually learn those skills and how to step out of the way to let the kids learn them. So, you know, I can understand that with a very young child who's just learning to do a lot of things. Parents do a lot of modeling, and they say, no, let me show you, do it this way. But um, it's kind of hard for some parents to transition out of that, um, in that mode so that kids not only are doing it themselves, but actually are allowed to make mistakes. So mm-hmm. what, what tips do you have for, for parents about that? Well... What I often recommend is to think about what happens if you do it for them and what happens if you don't do it for them. And there are pros and cons to each. Now, sometimes, you know, if it's a dangerous situation, you're not going to let your toddler run out into the street and get run over by a car, clearly. So you're going to grab their hand and cross them, uh, walk them across the street. But when it comes to other things that they can do and make a mistake, like put their shirt on backwards or something like that, <laughs> you know, unless you're going in for the family photo, that's okay, right? And so letting them have these opportunities. And as they get a little older and they're teens, you know, the stakes get a little higher. So you have to gradually work with the individual child to let them know how, you know, what they can do and what trust you have with them and how capable they are. But the hardest part for parents is letting go. And sometimes it's not a matter of the kid. It's a matter of yourself and figuring out what's holding you back. Why aren't you letting go? Is it that you need to have control? Is it that you need to be needed? You know, what is it? And, and thinking about yourself and realizing that sometimes it's in the best interest of the child when you don't step in for them, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, it's it's very interesting what you say. I think that, that the idea of um, fear for parents mm-hmm. and what you say, I think is quite accurate about that need to be needed. Mm-hmm. We, we as parents of very young children just love, I mean, it, it's just kind of a... a and a push-pull kind of thing. We wish our kids didn't need us so much because it's mommy, 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 I need you mm-hmm. to do this and this. Um, and so you want them to learn to do it themselves. But on the other hand, there's something um, very, very fleeting about that time of life when their kids look at you because you're the answer to all their problems. And mm-hmm. and when you transition out of that role, I think for a parent, it's, it's um, going into the unknown. It's like, well, if they don't need me, will they love me as much? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, there's some doubt there and, right, the need to be loved as well, like you said. Um, that can be hard. But, you know, sometimes, especially in later in the pleasant years, it's when you have to let them go a little bit and learn how to be adults. Because if you don't, they're going to be mommy, mommy, mommy when they're 25, running back home to live with you <laughs> and getting fired from their job. You know, I've been hearing a lot about um, presidents of companies who are actually getting phone calls and messages from parents of their employees. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this kind of dynamic where where the interference of the parent doesn't necessarily stop when the child graduates and and moves on to his or her own life and career. 
um, it's pretty appalling. And in some ways, uh, I'm thinking, whoa, someone has really blurred the, the boundaries here. Yep. And often the children, as we, the adult children at this point, really don't like that. They are embarrassed that their parents are calling in and it doesn't fare well for them either. You know, if you're the boss and some you know, one of your employee's parents is calling you, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily make you feel good and it's frustrating. So what, so what I'm hearing is that, that parents, of course, we have the best intentions at heart always for our children. Mm -hmm. We want them to succeed. Mm -hmm. We want them to be happy. And yet it sounds like in a way we don't trust that they can do that on their own. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually there's, you know, people are thinking that kids are a lot more fragile than they really are. And we often forget what we were doing at the ages that the kids are now. I mean, I was babysitting when I was 11. Now it's like you can't even leave your 11-year-old home alone, right? So it's, yeah. it's very different. And we're starting to disempower the kids by not giving them the opportunities to have independent time and, and take care of themselves. One of the things that you can do to help build trust is to help with the decision-making process and help the kids learn how to make decisions and what are the possible implications or consequences of the decisions they make and what kind of barriers they could face. And once they learn how to make decisions, then you know they're on the right track for when something does come up for them. I, I know. I love this. So it, it's like a testing ground. Mm -hmm. You can do hypotheticals, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. imagining. It's very safe. What would you do if? You can, right. you can use films or, or TV shows mm -hmm. that you're watching and and just like hit pause and say, wow, this is a difficult decision this character mm -hmm. has to make. You know, mm -hmm. what do you think might happen if they choose A, B or option mm -hmm. C? Um, and then in real life, I think that's going to make parents, as you say, feel more comfortable that their kid is learning decision making mm -hmm. skills. Right. It's sort of being a coach instead of doing it for them. You're you're helping them think through it and learn how to do it and empower them to be able to do it instead of just taking charge and saying, oh, they don't know how to do it yet. So you're standing by, guiding them and checking and asking the right questions. And and then if they make a decision and, and it doesn't turn out the way they thought, how about a debriefing session? Yes, exactly. Why, you know, what happened? What were you expecting to happen? You know, what could you have done differently? What will you do next time differently? Great. What mm -hmm. will you do next time instead of the fact that you made a mistake is you know, the worst thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there, there's an acronym that you use in your book, R-E-A-L, for real life, that I'd love you to mm -hmm. talk about. You have um, you have a stand-in for each of the, the four letters, R-E-A-L, and um, I just love it, and I wish you would talk about it a little bit. So let's start with R. R is resilient. Resilience is necessary to get through the hiccups in life, and, you know, you will have lots of them, and you need to be able to be resilient to get through that. And so how do parents best teach their kids resilience? Well, let them make mistakes. Let them fall. Let them skin their knees. You know, don't let them make the big mistakes, you know, like go off and do drugs or something. But let them make little mistakes and, and feel the pain, feel the suffering sometimes. The disappointment. And, yeah, uh -huh. disappointment. It's hard. Nobody wants to see their kids suffering. But, you know, we have to let them experience that so that they can learn that they can pick themselves back up and be strong and stay positive through a long run. That's great. Okay, that's R is for resilient. E is for? Empowered. So empowered means being able to take care of yourself and learn how to do things on your own. It means being independent. And we talked about learning how to make decisions. So it's getting out there, having the tools, knowing you can get the tools you need to be able to do things on your own. So interesting. I think that's a very hard one for parents, to, as you say, to be let their kids be out there on their own, literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. Right. So not necessarily running into the teachers to talk to them for the children, helping the kids learn how to say what they need to say to the teachers on their own and being there as a backup. Oh, well, it didn't go well with the teacher. OK, you know, again, how, what happened? What were you expecting? How could you talk to them differently? You know, things like that. How about even the idea of letting your kid ride his or her bike to their friend's house, which is two blocks away, which a yep. lot of parents are going, oh, no, now, <laughs> unless you are, um, you know, a very unfortunate person who lives in a war zone, um, right. you know, it should be okay for right. your kid. 
Yeah, maybe turning off the TV so that you're not watching these scary news, uh, you know, inform you know information that they're yeah. broadcasting to scare you. Yeah. Yeah, and and so I think when when parents lead with fear, the kids a become fearful, and mm -hmm. and they are not given the opportunity to be out there on their own and and empower themselves to say, okay, um, I, I can deal with this on my own. Okay, let's right. move on to A. What does A stand for in R-E-A-L? That's authentic. People need to be authentic. And that really deals with two things. One is having a character being true to yourself. And the second is being able to communicate that to others. Mm -hmm. We're finding that when people grow up and they're entering the workplace, they are lacking communication skills. Mm -hmm. And this is for a number of reasons. They're not talking as much as they used to because they're on the phone a lot, you know, texting. texting and, yeah. Right. <laughs> so the technology is a big factor there. But also learning how to mitigate conflict and, and deal with some of those issues with friends or, or people at school or, you know, negotiate a job uh, instead of having the parents step in and do it for them. So authenticity is being true to yourself and being able to express yourself in a way that uh, people can see who you are and, and you know, also not uh, having this facade of perfection at all times, too. That's you know, another thing that's... Yeah. Yeah, and I can imagine that that um, having people see who you are, and I'm just picturing in the workplace, so much of what we do is in group settings, um, problem solving with teams, and um, that idea of being able to communicate, which includes expressing yourself authentically, but also listening, actively listening, giving other people their fair share of the time mm -hmm. in, at the meeting. Um, and, and, oh, well, we're moving into your next one, which is L for limber, which I am assuming has something to do with flexibility. Right. Well, <laughs> listening is a good one though, because I coach executives on that all the time. So it's a hard one to learn, but the earlier you get it, the better, obviously. But limber is being flexible and being creative. Creativity is something that's being lost surprisingly uh, with the younger people because their lives are so structured. They're in activities that are run by adults constantly. They are in activities that have, you know, the right answer or, you know, a way of doing things. And so they get to the workplace. And I was just talking to somebody yesterday, in fact, who was saying that he's having challenges because his employees are asking him to tell them exactly how to get things done. And they, they don't want to think about how to do it themselves. It gives them a project and says, oh, go do this. And they say, no, tell me how to do it. And so being able to uh, be flexible when there's some ambiguity or not having all the instructions there or change gears, because that is the way of the workplace, is being able to shift quickly in the face of new information. That's another one. Yeah. So how, how can parents help kids become more limber? Well, that would be giving them some downtime so that they have time to be bored, perhaps, and be creative. And Mom, come up I'm bored. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. It's, you know, I loved it when I was, a, when my daughter was really young, we were driving someplace with a friend and her son was in the back. He was three and he said, I'm bored. What can I do? And she goes, look out the window. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. Just look out the window, see what you can see, you know, be so creative and, and have that opportunity rather than giving him a screen or, or a toy yeah. to play with that has something structured in it. So giving them the downtime and giving them opportunities to do things that aren't structured activities, right? We, we worry so much that we have to, you know, sign them up for this class and that class, mm -hmm. but maybe they can figure things out for themselves. Play is really important to developing these skills. You know, I can imagine for some parents when they get pushback with this, this kind of open-ended um, way of doing it and allowing their kid to feel boredom, the pushback may come from the child who's used to be being structured and catered to in this way. You know, when your kid says, I'm hungry, you provide food. But when your kid says you're, they're bored, um, our impulse may be, oh, that, that's a terrible thing. We don't want the child to be bored. So here, do this. Or here's something for you to do. Instead of um, look around, <laughs> the the proverbial look outside the window could be look around your room. What right. Do you, what do you have here, and what can you do with it? You right. figure it out. Um, and and for parents not to cave in when their kid says, "I don't want to figure it out. You tell me what to do." To resist that temptation, yeah. I think is really important. 
Yeah, it's tough to be a parent. <laughs> it really is sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> At times it is. But, you know, um, I think the bottom line is that when when you're in this job at the end of your kind of close at range parenting you've got a fully functioning independent creative productive self-reliant empowered authentic young adult and you can say wow um that that was what it was about and right. stepping back is sometimes what you need to do yep yeah, I couldn't have said it better, <laughs> Annie. Thank you. <laughs> well, we only have a couple of minutes left, Joni, and I'd love for you to give our listeners and viewers an opportunity to learn where on the web they can find out more about your book and your work. Okay, well, my book website is called flyingwithout.com, and that tells you a lot about the book. It actually has a free chapter as well if you want to get a sample of what the book is about. And you can buy the book on the uh, internet, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can even go to your local bookstore if you want to ask them to get you a copy. And my normal website is also FlexibleWorkSolutions.com. That's where I do my business. Uh, but you can get all of that on FlyingWithout.com. That's great. I want to thank you very much for writing this book. I read a lot of parenting books. And what I loved about yours is it, it's, it's very concrete. It's very common sense. And yet it bends a lot of assumptions. And so I learned some stuff. And I'm always eager to read books where I learn things. So thank you for writing it. Well, thank you, Annie. This has been a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> Likewise. You have a good one. This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential. To learn more about my work with tweens, teens, and parents, visit AnnieFox.com. And check out my parenting book, Teaching Kids to Be Good People. And my latest book for tween girls, the girls' Q&A book on friendship, 50 Ways to Fix a Friendship Without the Drama. And if you like this podcast, review us on iTunes. It'll help other folks find the show. Family Confidential Podcast is produced by Electric Egg Plant, creators of books and apps for parents, kids, tweens, and teens. And tune in next time when my guest will be parenting coach Aaron Schiller. Aaron and I will be talking about 21st century dads. Until then, happy parenting. Happy parenting.